Everybody. Good to see everybody this morning on this beautiful April day in Southwest Oklahoma. If you're a visitor, we want to know that we are, you're so, we're so glad you're here. Uh, we want to get to know you after a little bit. Just uh, stay a little bit longer so we can shake your hand or bump your fist or give you a hug, whatever. We want, we want to know you're welcome here. If you have kiddos, we have some excellent programs going on during the lesson that uh, kids will be left, uh, they'll uh, be asked to be released and they'll be escorted to their classes. So right now we're going to continue singing to our amazing God. Let's sing. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee. And out of Zion till salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as wide in your world, and we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee. And out of Zion till salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. 
There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Let the blind say, I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. In the river I will wade, there my sins are washed away. By the heaven's mercy stream of the Savior's love for me. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. I will Saving arms of God, I will sing salvation songs. Jesus Christ has set me free. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died.
So our scripture reading this morning will be from Romans chapter 8, verse 28 through 39. Uh, if you want to pull that up, uh, Wyatt will read that here in a minute. But in Paul's writing to the Romans, he discusses the freedom to become like Christ and discover God's limitless love. As Wyatt reads, I hope you will be encouraged uh, by Paul confirming that it is impossible for us to be separated from Christ. His death for us is proof of his unconquerable love. With this knowledge, we can overcome the thought of not being good enough and the feeling abandoned when facing hardships. Nothing can stop Christ's constant presence with us. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also pre predestined. For those God to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those who predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us? How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, no, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, what? Man, as I was standing behind him, I realized I'm gonna be, his head's gonna be above mine here before long. Wow, jeez. Uh, let's, uh, as we take the bread, go to our Father in prayer. Lord, as we approach your table, may I just say thank you. Thank you for your unwavering love for me and my brothers and sisters here today. That love played out on the cross and gives us uh, confidence that you work in all things for our good. You turn every circumstance around for our long range good. Lord, thank you for your body that was broken and restored so that we may have hope for tomorrow. As we are, continue our time of reflection, I thank you for always receiving us. Receiving us as we are. Through our faith in Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, we know that we can come to you and find reception, forgiveness, love, and communion. 
Lord, thank you for securing our salvation even before the foundation of the world. Your love is eternal, your wisdom and power supreme, and we rest assured that you will guide and protect us until we one day stand in your presence. What a glorious day that will be. Thank you, Lord. Now we have a time to give back. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the for you giving us all the opportunity to be here to be here today. We are all so blessed and thank you for the ability to give back to others and just help us to always remember you are with us, and with you, no evil can stand against us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my days. I will praise you all my days. You're perfect in all your ways. You're perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. I will obey your word. I will obey your word. I want to see your kingdom come. I want to see your kingdom come. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb. Glory, glory to the Lamb. Lead us with your mighty hand. Lead us with your mighty hand. We will conquer in your name. We will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. Hail, hail, line of Judah. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How powerful you are. How powerful you are. Lord God, strong and mighty. Lord God, strong and mighty. How wonderful you are. You are. How wonderful you are. Oh, how wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. Oh, how wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. Shines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Way beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Way beyond the blue. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him to. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him to. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him to. Way beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. And the church said, amen. amen and amen. Great to see you today. Got some visitors with us today. Again, thank you so much for coming and being part of Western Hills today. You know, it's always is a blessing. All these years, when I first came here 30 plus years ago now, I remember walking into this, this sanctuary. It was kind of long and skinny at the time. 
I think we've had nine uh, remodel jobs, building programs um, since I've been here. And uh, the elders haven't fired me yet, so I'm thankful for that. Because they say actually during building projects is when pastors, ministers get fired the most. And so I asked them to, to, to delay at least another five or six years uh, for another one. So anyway, we're seeing what happens there. God is good, amen? amen? But I remember coming here and seeing this sanctuary, and I still have pictures in my office actually. And uh, Norm, you were a lot younger then. But... Um, <laughs> Um, all the red if, if, if anybody remembers the red raise your hand uh, trust me it was like three colors of red in this room it was a sight to see but um, God was being glorified nonetheless and look what he's done God is an awesome God thank you again for being here today up until 1954 three years actually before I was born um, no one had ever broken the four-minute mile in the run. They actually said it couldn't be done. It was impossible. It just couldn't happen. There was no way. Everyone tried, but no one succeeded until a guy by the name of Roger Bannister came along. And in 1954, he ran under four minutes. It was 359, just barely under four minutes. But he broke that barrier. It was an amazing feat, they said. But no one had ever done it up until 1954, with all the records ever done. Ten years after that, 336 people broke the four-minute mile. And since then, nearly 2,000 people have broke that four-minute mile. One of them is not me. But nonetheless, something happened. You see, the barrier was in the mind and there's where we hold a lot of barriers in our lives. And so I want to talk with you today about it's time to light, it's time to let go of what's holding you back in life. What is that? What's holding you back? We oftentimes, we want to blame other people for holding us back. We want to blame other things. We want to blame circumstances. But what is it that's holding you back? What is holding you back from what God wants you to be or what God has planned for you? God says, I have a good plan for your life. Then what's holding you back from getting that good plan finished in your life or completed or accomplished in your life? I can assure you it's not God. God is not the one holding you back. So it must lie within ourselves somewhere that we're being held back from what it is that we need to have our chains broken from, if you will, to break the barrier. So let me set the stage before we go to the scripture there. Jesus' walk here on earth, he, you know, of course, he had many followers and many loved him and he loved so much. And he loves you today. You need to know that, first and foremost, that God loves you. And, and you know, that's just not a cliche. It's not just words you say. You need to know that God loves you. Now, because God loves you doesn't mean he's going to save you. He gives you opportunity to be saved through and by the blood of Jesus Christ in which we took just a few moments ago to remind us what God's love did for us by sending his son. Give me an amen. amen. So know that. God does love you. But while Jesus was here, many people followed and many people loved him and he loved people. And one family that he loved, they have three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Well, during this period of time, there was a, a certain time that Jesus was away from this family, he was, but he was only two miles away, just two miles. And Lazarus becomes very ill, in fact. Jesus could have got there on time. It's just two miles. But Jesus didn't show up for four days after he died. Why? Why the wait? Let's see if we can find some things in the story today that's recorded here in the book of John, chapter 11. And it's a lengthy reading, but I want to point out just a few things. There's so many nuggets within this, because I believe it can teach us a message as well. Jesus teaches through these stories, and the stories don't end with the people that he tells you the story about. They're there for you and I to be able to read thousands of years later and find something in it that blesses our lives. 
that causes us to have a deeper faith in the God that loves us so that we in return can love him even more in our lives. So let's find out as we read. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. That's where Jesus was. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary's to uh, comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Underline these next words, but I know that even now, I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said, your brother's going to rise again. Martha answered and said, oh, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Her faith was there. Her connection was there. She believed that. She knew what Jesus had talked about. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. You've heard that many times, haven't you? He says, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. That's the opposite of what the the world tells you. You see, the Christian is not moving from life to death. We are moving from death to life because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Oh, yes, Lord, she told me. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Do you believe this morning? And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher's here. And he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up and quickly went out to him. Now Jesus had not entered into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had been, had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she had got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she had been gone to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled, underlying these words, where have you laid him? Very important in your life. Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. My friend, I want you to know that Jesus knows exactly where you're at today And if if your heart is broken, Jesus is right there with you. Jesus wept. Don't move past that too quick. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Of course. They had been around this one. Jesus said had performed many miracles. And Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was the cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Sound familiar? Underline. Take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there for, for days now, four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked up to the said to the Father, Father, I thank you for all that you have heard, that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of people in Western Hills Church of Christ 2,000 years from now. But I said this, so that those standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and his feet were wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, write it down, mark it, underline it, take off the grave clothes and let him go. What a story. 
Can you imagine the dinner that night? Can you imagine that afternoon, how many people that were gathered there? You know, after church, when the church is let out, and we say, hey, man, you can go home, whatever the case is. Everybody's out in the foyer or in the mornings when they come in. People are shaking hands, and they're hugging each other, and they're all smiles. How you doing? How's the week? How's the kids? How's this? What's going on in your life? All those things. Can you imagine what took place after this? All the questions. What was it like? Was it dark in there? Did you see a bright light? <laughs> what was it like? Did you see anything at all? Were you worried? Was it a good place? What happened? Oh, we're so glad to see you. You look great. You look years younger. It's just wonderful. Pass the potatoes, please. Conversations went on after this. These people witnessed this man that was dead for four days walk out of a grave. They had not yet seen Jesus walk out of the grave. He hadn't gone to the cross yet. And they saw Jesus call a man right out of the grave that they knew was dead. Tell me they don't have a story. Tell me they didn't tell their kids. Tell me they didn't tell their neighbors. Tell me that they didn't put up a sign somewhere that said, He is alive! Come and see Lazarus! Can you imagine his testimony the next week at church? Oh, well, I got something to tell you, folks. Something went on. Pretty amazing story. Someone said, well, you can't really read all that into it. So I suppose you're thinking they just went home that night and just pretended that nothing ever happened. I'm pretty sure there was something that went on. What can we learn from those four statements that I gave you a little earlier? Let's see if we can find something for ourselves today. Number one is this. It's the I know that even now spirit in us. You remember what Martha first said? She says, I know that even now. Did you hear her confidence that was there? She was looking at reality, and the reality was her brother was dead. The reality was her heart was broken. The reality was she was just broken in heart. But she said, but I know that even now. Do you know that? then even now is where you learn to give it up. You learn to give it up. You, 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 you see the reality of things. You see in reality, but you are called to walk by faith. There is a reality of things, but there's a faith thing that God says you and I can have when we give our life to Christ because of God loved us so much. And when we give our life to Christ, we have this now, this ability to have this faith in something that's greater than what reality tells us. Because reality is not all of it. Because God is in it. Give me an amen. amen. The God living in us is what is important to note here. You remember last week and I talked about the Spirit living in us? There was a reason why I gave that. And that's why I wanted to come back to this this week. Is because the God living in us is important. It's important to note that what God has planned for our lives. He has given us the Spirit so that we can live a life. Not die, but live a true life, he says. He did not want us to go without having the capability to accomplish the tasks, the hurts, the pains, the situations that you are going through, that I'm going through in my life. Whatever they are, God says, I don't want to leave you empty-handed. I'm here for you, and I will strengthen you in your walk to be the best husband you can be, the best mother that you can be, to be the best child that you can be, the best worker that you can be, the best person, the best person that God has called us to be in this world that is pretty dark. God gives us his spirit. Give me an amen. Someone wrote these words. I found this one this week and I added it to my good list of things to quote more often. God commands us, they say, God commands us to be filled with the spirit. And if we aren't filled with the spirit, it's because we're living beneath our privileges. God gives us the privilege to live by the spirit, by faith and not by sight. When the reality of something is seen, he doesn't want us to pretend as though it's not happening. He understands that it's happening. He understands what reality is. He understood what reality was for all those. No, he's been dead for four days. He saw the reality there. However, his desire is that we would remember that we and with him all things are possible. That's what he wants. 
He understands. He doesn't want you to do away with reality of life. I don't know where you're at in your life, in your marriage, in your, in your finances, in, in raising your children, in just the hurts and the pains of, of just the confusion or depression or whatever it is that you might find yourself in life. God understands the reality of that. But God says, with me, all things are possible. I give you a measure of something that you don't have. I give you a power that's from me. Martha called out on what she believed, or she called on what she believed, not what she saw only. That has to be learned by the Christian, by the way. You know why it has to be learned by the Christian? It has to be learned because it's not natural. It was not natural for a person to walk out of that grave. But he did. And, and for you and I, it has to, it's not a natural thing to only rely on our faith in God. When someone says this and you say, well, that's the reality that you're saying. But I believe this. There are those in this room, the doctors told you something. And that was the reality. I know a person that sits in this room back here in the back every Sunday. And the doctor said, this is the reality of what you have. And his answer was, yes, I see reality, but I know my God. Faith moves God into action in our lives. That has to be learned of the Christian, because it's not natural. But we have to remember, we don't call on the natural, we call on the supernatural. Give me an amen. In Romans chapter 4, the scripture says that God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they are. Did you catch that? That's pretty powerful. Because that's what he's telling us in this story as well. The blind man couldn't see, but he does see. Tell him that it doesn't work. The lame man couldn't walk, but he walked. Tell me it doesn't work. Tell him it doesn't work. And for you and I, what has he called into our lives? We were dead in our transgressions and sin. And God set us free and has forgiven us of all of our sins because of Jesus the Christ and what he did on the cross and my faith in him and him alone. Give me an amen. amen. That should be a hallelujah there. I'm going to have to get my sign back out. When I first came here, I made a little sign. You know those little fans you used to get at the funeral homes when somebody died? Anybody remember those days? Yeah, 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 they had to hand them out. Anyway, so I got one of those and put on the back, hallelujah. And when I thought out I needed a hallelujah, I just held it up. Somebody remind me to do that. I want to get another sign and put out there. In fact, people started calling me hallelujah Harley. Trust me, I've been called a whole lot worse. That's a pretty good one. I know what I have seen, but even now, I know. It's what you're saying. Have you said that about the situation you're working through right now? I know what I see, but even now, I know. We sing this song. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. Sing it. But I know I am believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. A little high, Kevin, but it's all right. I know. Number two. The second one was, where is it that you have laid him? In this case, I would say, where have you laid it in your life? Because we are really good about hiding things behind barriers. You must be willing to take him to where your hurt, your pain, your sorrow, your confusion, your doubt, your, all the things. Don't worry about telling God that you doubt that he even exists. He already knows it. God, I don't even know if you're there for me. That's being honest with God. All of a sudden, something starts to change. But you and I have to be willing to take him to where it is that we've laid it. 
We have to be able to tell him and show him where the hurt is. It's not for him. He already knows it. It's for your benefit. It's for your benefit. He didn't need to have them go there to the stone. He could have said simply as, ah, he's right, right over here, here's Lazarus right here. But he didn't. There's a reason. It's for your benefit. You need to take him to where your hurt is. Are you hurting today? You see, you may say, no, I'm not. No, I'm good to go. Mr. Davidson, Harley, yeah, preach a guy. Hey, I'm ready to go to lunch. I'm good. I'm good. I'm telling you, there's somebody probably on your roll that's not good today. And you just need to reach out to God and you need to show Him where it is that you are hurting or your pain or confusion, doubt, depression, whatever it is. There's, there's so much going on in your life. God understands that, but show Him where it's at. When I was a little kid, and I've shared this before, but you know, on rainy days, we didn't have a lot of games and stuff to play, you know, board games and things or you know, whatever. So we would go to our mom's uh, sewing machine and we'd get out a thimble. Thimble, thimble, who can find the thimble? Anybody play that game when they were little besides me? You need to, you, you parents out there that know that, or grandparents, you need to teach your kids that's a good one, man. It's a good game. It doesn't cost you much. So anyway, so the, the deal was you take that little thimble, that's keep from poking your finger or thumb, and then you would take it and hide it somewhere and then the other kids would all go look for it. Hot, cold, 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 freezing, iceberg, whatever, oh, hot, you're burning up. There it is. Hey, I won the, all right, whatever. But in that, have you ever, if you ever played that game, sometimes we would forget, because it took so long, we would forget where it was hidden. And then when mom's in the sewing machine, you know, the business here or whatever, and she's looking, where's my thimble? Why? Uh, Larry took it, and that's what I said. But in that process, sometimes that's the way we are as Christians. What I mean by that? We tuck it away so deep, so far, so long that we fail to remember where it is. Listen, God says He will remove it as far as the east is from the west. But He is also says that you can't hide it. Because I know where it's at. And you are the one that needs to tell me about it. You need to show me. We have become more. We have to become more in our lives. We have to become, become more like David was. And David, he says, create in me this clean heart, O God. Find out if there's any offensive way within me. He's saying, search me, O God. Search me and try me in this. Find out where it is. Bring it to my attention. Why? In order that I might find the healing that comes with it. You see, some of you think if you can hide it long enough, God will forget about it. No, you might forget about it, but God hasn't forgotten about it. God is just waiting on you to reveal it to him so, he can for, so that he can give you forgiveness so that you can move on past that. That you can have the healing that you really, really want in your life. In other words, get it out of the box. You have been hiding it in it, and then you can honestly let it go, and you can be set free. Isn't that good news? Number three, he says, remove the stone. Remove the stone. What were these people expecting when they removed the stone? She told us, didn't she? Rotten flesh. A smell. But Jesus meant what he said. He said, remove the stone. What, is, what was he saying? You have to trust me. You say you do, Martha. You say you do, Mary. You say you do, my followers. But do you trust me? That's a big key in our lives. We have to learn to trust him even when we think we know better. How do I know that? Because that's what you teach your children. Any of us that have had children and grandchildren, you know that. Your children always think they know better than you, don't they? Uh, has that happened to you at all? Oh, I know better. And there comes a point with your children, you have to simply say, no, I know what's better for you. And they're saying, no, I know what's better for me. And I'm going to do it anyway. Anybody ever do it anyway and find out that your parents were actually brilliant? Yeah. I remember doing that with a fork and a light switch. 
They said the electrons in that thing are really powerful. And I thought to myself one time, if it can turn a light on when you flip this switch, then what would it do <laughs> if I bent this fork? Well, now you know why I'm so short and balding. But anyway, we won't go there. Just because you are a grown-up doesn't mean that you always know what's best for you in your life. Somebody need to hear that today. Because that's what we think when we're grown up and I can make my own decision. I'm out of the house to make my own decision. I already know what's best for my life. Just because you're a grown-up doesn't mean you always know what's best for your life. For instance, there's someone here today you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. There's always some in the crowd. You've never given your life to Christ. And what you're saying is, I know what's best for my life. You're, you're, you're saying, I can get there. I can do this on my own. The truth is, you can't do it on your own. Yes, I can. Thank you very much. And there comes a time when a parent has to simply say, go right ahead. And then we learn lessons, hopefully. Hopefully they won't be ones that harm us so bad that there's no coming out of it. And in this process, the, the, God wants us to understand He knows what's best for us. That you can't get to heaven without accepting Jesus Christ. Well, yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, I can't. Okay? Keep fighting it. But until you come to that belief that you can't climb that ladder to heaven without Jesus, you will keep climbing and you will never get there. Someone needs to hear that today. And that's not to put you down. It is to tell you that God loves you so much that he said, I have given you my son so that you can get there on what he has done and not what you think you can do to get you there. Amen. Big difference. Do you trust him? So others of us, most of us in this room, have already accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Give me an amen. amen. Okay, very good. But here's the problem. Oftentimes... Do we trust him with everything or just the things we want to trust him with? Did you catch that one? Do we trust him with everything or just what we want to trust him with? In other words, we do the measuring. Thank you very much, God. We have a tendency to do that. Listen, all sin is forgivable, but only to the depth in which you ask. Did you catch that one? You should. Here we go. Trying to control your life, someone said, is a little bit, it's dangerous. But they went on to say, it's kind of like holding a firecracker too long. You don't know the extent of the damage until it's too late. Yeah. My friend, to let it go, you have to open up and let God remove the stone. You have to let him do that for you. Here's a good general piece of advice I give people often. And you've heard me say it over the years. When you read God's word, just simply read it. And when it tells you to do something that you've never done, just do it. I haven't done that. Huh. I need to do that. If you read God's word and you find something that you've been doing that it tells you to not be doing, then you just need to stop it. Hmm. Huh. I don't want to stop that. But God tells me to. That's that battle that goes on. The Spirit will help you stop it. I know people that had drinking problems and smoking problems or whatever it, addictions that you feel that you may have. They couldn't do it, couldn't do it, couldn't do it. Gave their life to the Lord. And what were they now relying on? They were relying on the power of the strength of God to help them get past what they couldn't do on their own. Now that doesn't mean the person isn't drawn back to that. It doesn't mean that the person is always, always not pulled into that direction because that's what happens with addictions. They take a hold of us. But here's the key. Get addicted to Christ and His Spirit living in you. And then your walk will be so much easier to simply say, no, that's what I was, that's what I did, but that's not who I am, and that's not what I'm going to be about anymore. In the name of Jesus, I claim victory over that. God wants you to have victory today and set you free. That's called obedience. Remove the stone that's holding you captive. God's waiting on you to set you free. How long are you going to make him wait? Number four, we're finished. Take off the grave clothes, 44, verse 44. When Jesus walked out of the grave years later, or a time period later, when Jesus walked out of the grave, his grave clothes were left behind, folded nice and neat. 
I saw the picture. Um, but anyway, whatever. But they were folded nice and neat. But the scripture does tell us that. They were folded there. But not the case with Lazarus. Not his case. I often wondered about that. Wonder why. I mean, Lazarus could have just walked out and looked at what was the reasoning behind it. I'm not sure of all the reasons. We could discuss that and debate that, I suppose. But Lazarus came out wrapped in this grave clothes. Jesus wanted for everyone there to see it for themselves. Maybe they weren't when they buried him, weren't there when they buried him. They wanted to see because they knew what grave clothes meant. Grave clothes are a sign that it's over. It's over, it's done. And when Jesus said, take off the grave clothes, he knew that he was just starting. He was just a new beginning. Why did I bring that one up? In your baptism, someone say, well, what's so important about baptism in my life? Listen to me closely. In your baptism, you take off the grave clothes, Scripture teaches. You're buried with Christ Jesus, the Scripture says. You're buried with Christ Jesus. Did you catch that? That's why he gives you something else to wear when you become the Christian and when you rise to walk in newness of life. He says, you see what you have dressed in before. Becoming a Christian is grave clothes, meaning you are headed for death and not life without God. And When you become his child, you are given a new set of clothes. The scripture tells us that to wear a new set of clothes and death no longer has a hold on you. For there is no grave deep enough to hold the child of the Most High God. The scripture tells us, For all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourself with Christ. Someone here today, you've not been clothed with Christ because you've never experienced this thing called baptism. But today can be your day. Today can be your day when you take those grave clothes off and you can no longer, you you can now say, I'm no longer held by the grave. I'm set free because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. That's good news, my friend. The things in life that you fail to remove or let God remove from you are as grave clothes in your life that restrict you and hold you back. And sometimes what we do is we wrap ourselves up with more of that. After we've been set free, we just find ourselves wrapping ourselves once again and want to be bound by that. And Jesus is asking someone today, I believe with all my heart, He's asking you, don't you want to be set free again? Don't you want to just break all that loose again? Don't you remember what it was like when you gave your life to Christ at that that very moment? Santiago is here today. I appreciate a young man back there in the back. Give me a wave, Santiago. Right there, a young Christian man. I just baptized him a week ago. Give him a round of applause. Uh, and I want to tell you, he's a fine young man, but he, 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 he discovered by searching the Scripture and knowing what he needed to do, not, not necessarily what he, everybody was saying, but he studied the Word of God. And when by studying the Word of God, he realized, he realized that he was bound in those grave clothes. He didn't want to be bound anymore. He's an officer in the military. He wanted to be set free. He wanted to be set free. And on that day when, when I took his confession here and, 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 and here he, and we went into the water together, he just came out and you could just see so excited in tears and we hugged each other as brothers in Christ because both of us know we don't know where our paths will cross and how many more paths or times it will cross in this life. He's headed back to Florida. But we know one thing for sure, Santiago, we know one thing for sure is that in Jesus Christ we are brothers for eternity. Do you know that, my friend? Do you know that? Do your children know that? This is the most important thing in your life. Don't hold back. So don't you think it's time to release your faith in Him today? And don't you think it's time to take Him... Your hurt, your loss, your pain, and yes, even your sin. And allow Him to see what you think you have been hiding from Him. 
Today, allow him to roll away the stone in your life. To remove the grave clothes and set you free. Don't you think it's time? Don't you think it's time to let go of what's holding you back? I can assure you, God does. Why not, say, why not see how good our God really is? You need to respond, you come as we stand and sing. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He answers seated just real quick. I want to do something here real. Go back to that first verse on that one if you could please. You know God is so good. Has it been good to you this week? How about over here anybody? Any takers over here? God is so good? Listen to this group right over here. We're just going to sing. You guys just listen. God is so church. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. Oh, He's so good to me. Answer prayers. Anybody have an answer prayer over here? This week? You need an answer prayer? And just this just just this section right here. He answers prayers. Oh yes he does. He answers Yes, and today he wants to answer yours. right over here but let's do the caring thing is it the next one he cares for you know does anybody here know that he cares for you he cares for me you know that don't you isn't it good to know that God cares for you huh To know that he loves us, to know that he hears our prayers, and to know that he cares for us is why we all say, I love him so. Oh, yes. Put your hands up. I love him so. 
He's telling I love you so, God. I love you so. You can raise your hands in the ball game. He's so good to me. One more time. Oh, God, we love you. I love you so, God. I love you. I love you so. I love you so. Oh, you're so good to me. And the whole church said, Amen. God bless y'all. Good morning. He does love us so. And, uh, and if you'd go ahead and put the scripture up for today, if it's, there it is. If you'd like to stand, we'll have our scripture and closing prayer. So appropriate after uh, Harley's message today. We serve a mighty and powerful God who does not let the grave or death stand between him and us and the love that he wants to show us. Please join me. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God, we thank you so much for displaying your majesty and your glory in all that you have created, and especially in the people that you have created that surround us with your love and uh, that you use each day to demonstrate how much you love us as you live in us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week.